Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. Welcome into another edition of the JMU Sports News Podcast. I am Bennett Conlon, joined by Jack Fitzpatrick. Jack, you're in Iowa today. Yeah, I'm in Iowa for the State Fair of the state of Iowa, of course. Um, Man, Iowa is flat, got a lot of corn. Trying to think of other things to say about it, but there's not much. Hearing any rumblings there from the Big Ten or or Big Big 12 crowds of of worries of what the Sun Belt could be and the threat the Sun Belt poses? Well, I'll say I've been talking with a lot of people about sports betting at the Iowa State Fair. And, you know, there's been a lot of excitement about the Big Ten, Big 12. Of course, you know, the Big Ten just added USC, UCLA, some really exciting stuff happening there. Big 12, of course, they're losing a few guys, but there's still a lot of hope and excitement. But I've been there to remind them all that the Sun Belt is the best conference in college football. Um, and I've, I've received a few laughs back about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it is, it is what it is. And, and I'm right. So. You are in fact, correct. I feel like some JMU fans have started like really almost oversell the Sun Belt, which I love. I love that for us, but going into the year, it's like <laughs> the best league in America in every sport. Yeah, and I believe which it is. It is. It is truly the best, uh, especially for football, where I think we're all expecting JMU to win a natty, and quarterback battle is still raging on, according to Kurt Zignetti, which I don't know how long he'll continue the charade, but it seems like for a bit longer. Yeah, there's no uh, – I get what he's doing, and it feels like Houston did this every year. Um, you even bought into it with Houston with Connor Mitch. You were on the Connor <laughs> Mitch train, but it, it's a thing that's done every year. And I just don't, I don't fully get it. Like we all know, Todd Santeo is the starter, and it's also hilarious because like the post, like practice comments that Signetti's giving, where he's like, "This is a six-year guy. He's been starting at the pow- at the group of five level for two years. Like this guy knows what he's doing." And like that, those are the comments. It's not like, man, Billy Atkins is out here really slinging the rock and giving Todd everything he can. Instead, it's Todd's experience. He knows what he's doing. He's a veteran leader on this team. And it's just like, yeah, we, we know, just, just name that already. But we all know there's going to be oars next to each name on the QB depth chart come around whenever the first O'Neill's press conference is. I think he's going full, full Todd, no or. It'll be Centeno. so? Yeah, I think he might do or for like Atkins Barnett, but uh, I, I feel like he's he's a believer in Todd. I think he's given him okay full trust and belief, and I'm excited for it. I will say the like long term me is interested in the idea of one of the young guys starting this year or playing a lot, just for like what that would mean for the future. But yeah. realistically. They're going to play Santeo, and the next year they're still going to bring in some transfers. So it, it's kind of a waste of um, – it doesn't mean that the transfer will get the job yeah. next year, but uh, there's no real reason to, to play a young guy if he's not QB1 this year. Yeah, exactly. Although I, I see what you mean, but, yeah, they'll, they'll bring in someone else. It might be like a Brian Shore type of thing where he just has to beat out a Connor Mitch. Yeah. Um, I mean, and it's very plausible that Alonzo Barnett or Billy Atkins will do that. It seems like there's been a lot of hype around them. Granted, there was a lot of hype around Gage Maloney each year, and he's over at Bryant now. So, actually, I don't know if he graduated or not. I don't know. I don't know. And uh, elsewhere, tomorrow, Thursday, we're recording this on a Wednesday, the first JMU sporting event of the season, women's soccer host VCU. It'll be on ESPN Plus. So what? we are we're entering the Sun Belt era, which I think is very exciting. Uh, I don't know how like large the Jamie following is around women's soccer normally, but I imagine there are going to be a lot of eyes tuned into that game that ordinarily might not be. Do you think they win? They were picked to finish pretty high up in the Sun Belt. I don't know exactly what that means for women's soccer. Um, I'll say I'll say they do, but I, I truly have no idea. But I okay. playing at home first game of the year, sure. I like it. Yeah, me too. All right. That's a great prediction. You know what else is a great prediction? Our breakout players. You broke them down on – oh, wait. You know what we haven't even said? Well, you, you Pretty much, boys. 
Yeah, you got to say your three notch boy. You you got the three notch boys little spiel going down. I think you you can handle that today, right? Yeah, sure. We we had mentioned. I guess we mentioned it not on the podcast, right? We just mentioned it on on Twitter. This is our first th- podcast since signing the deal, bearing the lead. Yeah, <laughs> three notched in Harrisonburg. They have multiple locations in the valley, but we're kind of specifically working a little bit with that Harrisonburg tap room is going to sponsor us throughout football season, potentially longer, but at least throughout football season. Uh, We're excited to to partner with them. I think we're going to try maybe at some point during football season or basketball season to get down there and maybe host a podcast from the tap room. Might have some other exciting little things in the works, but really excited to be working with them. So if you're in Harrisonburg, check out the tap room. If you're not in Harrisonburg, they sell their beer near you. Check it out, purchase it. I'm a I'm a big three notch guy. I really love their products and and their their beer. I think it's probably the best in the valley, in my opinion. Oh, 100 percent Also, it's worth noting they have tap rooms, I think, in Richmond now, mm-hmm. Roanoke, Charlottesville. I want to say Virginia Beach too, but I'm not hundred percent on that one. But I mean, if you're listening to this, odds are you're probably either in Northern Virginia, Richmond, or Harrisonburg. So if you're in Richmond too, check out their uh, tap room, newly opened. I think within the last two weeks or something like that. So big stuff happening for them, big stuff happening for us, check them out. Um, and hopefully we can get down there and do a live podcast, maybe for the coastal game to wrap up the season. Um, but won't necessarily put a date on anything because both of our schedules are quite hectic. Yeah. Who knows, but excited about that. Excited about working with them and uh, excited for some breakout players, Jack. Yeah, and also Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports, contests, and events with first to market odds and lines. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports information from live in game betting, bra- props, and futures. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to join and make your first sports bet. Use promo code BELIEVE, that's promo code B-L-E-A-V-50, to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, where the game starts. And uh, breakout players, who'd you, who'd you break down the video last week again? Yeah, so I went with Maxwell James at wide receiver. Uh, I caught a touchdown in the spring game. He's 6'2". You know I'm kind of a sucker for size at the receiver position. Redshirt freshman. I feel like he's got a chance to at least work in a little bit and start to sort of cement himself as someone um, who can have a really large impact on the receiving core for years to come. It, I think it's maybe a more competitive group than people realize. Maybe even I realized when I recorded the video, um, there's been some nice chatter about Terrence green. The Monmouth transfer had a one handed snag. They put in a video that people are sort of losing their minds over. Um, so he's pretty good. Obviously, we know what Chris Thornton can do. I think Reggie Brown is good. I really like Devin Ravenel. I feel like he's like underrated in terms of speed and size. Yeah. But I think Maxwell James has got to keep an eye on. He's a good player, good size. Uh, so I had him on offense. And then defensively, I did Jalen Walker, which is kind of a softball pick. The the sophomore linebacker who is expected to kind of have a, <laughs> a starting role or a major contributing role. So, um, you know, playing linebacker in JMU's defense, if they put you in the the two deep and you're getting snaps yeah pretty easy to be a breakout player i think i I like both of those picks you know who i'm going with with it's kind of maybe an interesting one it might not be a true necessarily when you say breakout to me it kind of is like a freshman or someone newer to the team that right is going to break onto the scene i'm picking someone here to highlight that has been on the team for a few years but i think this is when they take like a real step forward and they they reclaim what you know Rondell Carter, the gaps that he left, and and some of the other guys. I'm going to go Abi Akonji. Mm. He played in 14 games last season, eight in 2020. He recorded just 17 tackles in total. He did have five tackles for loss, two and a half sacks, a forced fumble, and two fumbles recovery. So, I mean, his stats are solid, right? They jump off the page, not jump off the page, but they're really solid. And for a guy where it seems like you lose Mike Green – you lose a couple key contributors along those lines. I think he can step into it and he comes from Minnesota, the big 10. There was kind of high expectations around him when he first got into Harrisonburg and not that he hasn't lived up to him. I think he had to break through a very deep depth chart 
and mm-hmm. this is his opportunity to break through it. And I think we might see a double digit sack season from Avi and uh, some good tackle for losses. And I think he becomes kind of a mainstay along the edge uh, for JMU. Also, we got to get ourselves a pronunciation guide. I think you did a good job with that one, but I was looking at like the, the media guide they had. I don't even think it had a pronunciation guide. It was like hundreds of pages and I'm, I'm like, where's our pronunciation guide? So I might wait, have to reach out. Wait for uh, game notes week one. You know exactly. You think it'll be in there? Oh, it'll be in there. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll, it's kind of hard to wait for game notes, but I'll do my best. That defensive line is also stacked. Like yeah. there are names that I keep forgetting, like uh, Kamara, the, the redshirt freshman who people have talked about being a, a player who can contribute. Obviously they got some other main guys. And I always forget they have the Rutgers transfer. I think it's Chroma. He's, he's 6'4", 260, and people have sort of talked. I think TJ Eck is one who tweeted that he just looks massive at practice. So he's a guy that that certainly has some ability there. And I don't know. I like what they have a, along the defensive line. I'm excited about it. Yeah, for sure. I also really like what they have in um, linebackers. I know we've kind of talked about it where they, they're not deep in linebackers, mm-hmm. but I think their starters will be really solid this season. I hear you. All right. Who's your offensive uh, breakout player? That's a great question. I'm not going to go Todd Santeo, even though I think he's going to tear up the sum. I think I will do this as a little quick aside with Todd Santeo. If, if I'll, I'll, I'll cover my butt with if, if he gets the starting job, I think he'll put up like really good numbers. Mm-hmm. I think he'll be like a really, really not saying we're going to win a lot of games, but I think he'll put up like some solid overall numbers that, might lead or be at the top half, top third of the Sun Belt. Um, so that's kind of my cop out answer. I think he'll break onto the scene and be a really, really solid quarterback for the Dukes this season. Let me scroll through this. Let me scroll through this. Um, well, you scroll, I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Are we undervaluing JMU a little bit? I know we talked about that a little bit on the last podcast, I think it was. But you think Santeo is like a top third Sunbelt quarterback. Signetti has a pretty good track record with JMU quarterbacks. If he plays like a top tier guy, and we're talking about how the defensive line is loaded and we like the talent linebacker. Here's the thing. Running back. Here's the like, thing, though. The most impo- one of the most important position groups I just have so many questions on. Which one? The secondary. I'm not worried about safety, though. I kind which- of am. <laughs> What worries you about safety? I don't know. I just don't like, what is it? Q Reed and Jordan's who's the, who's the second safety it's Q Reed and who's going to be next. So to you him. got Q Reed. They added Jarius. What is it? Reminuk or something. The uh, Arkansas state transfer. Again, it's a real struggle that every contributor they have <laughs> is somebody I would like to look the pronunciation guy. And I just constantly forget. I could probably go look up a lot of them because they're transfers. It would just and be so many. There's Chris Chukawa. It's like Chuck, Chuck with Nikki. Sure. He's also, yeah, I get, yeah. He's good. Sam kid is a very good tackler who is, who is big on special teams and sort of stepped into a role. So he's been there a while. They still got Surratt, the, the VMI transfer. I think they've got a lot at, at safety that I kind of like. I, I don't know. I'm just worried. I guess I'm just worried about the corners that they return like four snaps from last season at the corner. I'm definitely worried about the corners. I haven't like, heard much about the corners. But it's like if, if, if they're getting burned, how much can, you know, the safeties as good as they are like, here's, I guess I should say this. I think the run defense is going to be elite. It should be pretty good. Like everything up the middle between the hashes I think is going to be really hard to move the ball on this JMU defense. But the, the, the problem is that it's going to be, in my opinion, really easy to move the ball outside of the numbers, outside of the hashes. Like, I think if you can just pick, maybe I'm also overvaluing the talent at the group of five level, but I just think like in the past three or four years, we've seen our secondary be terrible but not have it be taken advantage of because the best quarterback they're playing against is Davis cheek on a week in and week out basis. Right. But now you're playing up against, you know, Grayson uh, McCall, yeah, Grayson, Chase Bryce. Chase Bryce, all of these guys who, if you give them a wide open receiver 50 yards down the field, they're probably going to hit their target. And so that really worries me where no offense to Hollis Mathis. And I've been on this podcast before hyping up Hollis Mathis Hollis Mathis isn't hitting that. 
Yeah, there were some, there have definitely been over the years some like what should be 50 yard touchdown passes that are like incompletions because a guy misses a wide open. That's, that's certainly fair. It's going to be a big change. I'm just, I don't know. I, I feel like they've got some, some guys there that interest me for sure. The other thing I will say, um, sort of looking at the, the preseason coverage as somebody who was on the, the UVA beat the last couple of years and now not being on a beat and having more time to like read the coverage, they, typically spread it out well i guess sometimes you can ask for who you want so it depends by like which school but like uva for example would be like today you're talking to the defensive coordinator and the linebackers so sometimes there are very similar like requests that they do because it's convenient so if there's like a lot of sam kid hype one day it doesn't necessarily mean that like the secondary is great or that the safeties are great it means that sam kid spoke to four media members um, which is not like a, I think Sam Kidd is very good. It's, it's just not like, a dig at him at all, but I know it's just like that we haven't talked to like, Oh, we haven't heard anything from the corners. It's like probably cause they haven't like been made available as much to the media. So it's, there, it's there, kind there of, might be a really strong possibility. They won't be made available because they're not experienced guys. Or he hasn't like named starters. So if you talk to a guy and he ends up being a, a right, it's, you don't necessarily need a quote from like your, fifth string corner so i don't i don't know but it's it's worth noting that like the way they handle media things is sort of drives the preseason content a little bit so it doesn't necessarily mean like wow the linebackers are showing out like unless that's happening from scrimmages that like the beat reporters are seeing it could just be like the linebackers are speaking to the media and the linebackers coach is not going to be like yeah we're weak this year so yeah something to consider you gave me a lot of time to think over my answer here I have two answers for you for breakout offensive player. Okay. There's honestly not a lot of positions on the offense. You can talk about breakout QBs already taken off the table. I'm not going to sit here and talk about how I think Tyshawn Wyatt on the offensive line is going to be a breakout offensive lineman. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of the running backs because they've all been here now for three plus years. And it's just like, it's, be, it's beating a dead horse. You brought up Devin Ravenel. I think he's a really strong potential to be a breakout. He's a redshirt senior um, brother. Brandon Ravenel had a historic career at JMU and Devin's kind of been beat up by injuries these last couple of seasons. He hasn't really been at a hundred percent in probably two years. Um, I think he got, I want to say, I don't want to start any rumors, but I want to say he had COVID in the COVID year at the beginning of it. Never really got back up to full speed. If I remember that correctly. That sounds correct. I don't totally remember, but it sounds correct. So I just don't think he's been we and, and because of that, he's gotten pushed down on the depth chart. But there has to be someone on this wide receiver core that was so good that it pushed Kobe White out the door, a Boston College transfer that Kurt mm -hmm. Signetti was really excited about. And I think Devin Ravenel's that reason. I think Ravenel has catapulted up the depth chart and we're going to see him play a lot. Um, I'm also going to go and this might be just. This is completely there's this one isn't founded in any stats or statistics, but. And Jane, you tends to not under Kurt Signetti tends to use tight ends not that often. Um, you had Clayton Cheatham, who was an electric tight end, but I was doing the numbers last week. I think he had like six receptions last season. Each one was more electric than the last, but they just aren't used that often. You have Drew Painter, Noah Turner. I think there might be a little bit of usage of, and this might be an old takes exposed real quick. Cooper Thunel, Cooper Thunel, a Marshall transfer. I think that'd just be fun. He seems 6'4", 236, might be used as a more receiving tight end where Noah Turner and Drew Painter might be more used, you know, down type of guys um, as they have been in the past a little bit. He is uh, somebody to work, keep an eye on because he was the scout team player of the week Yeah, I uh, just for, the, for, I, for the middle of the Tennessee game in 2020. I just looked that up too. Maybe he's a really good scout team player though because Marshall coming over to the Sun Belt. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to. I, I, I didn't it would want be to, nice if they used a tight end a little. Yeah, I, I just didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to be completely just copying you with talking about Ravenel. I think Ravenel is the breakout player. If we're going to focus pick. on anyone, but I wanted to add a little bit of pizzazz. Shout out to my guy, Cop Cooper Thunel. Thunel, uh, <laughs> his tight end abilities coming from Marshall. Um, I just don't think. I think Drew Paytoner and Noah Turner though are the one and two tight ends. That's probably true. I think it would be any tight end that like gets involved could be a huge asset because you're right. Like I thought, what was it? Klusterman. And then they had Dean Cheatham. 
I guess it was Dean Cheatham and then Klosterman. But like they a few years back, like tight ends were like making a huge impact. Klosterman had a touchdown catch in the national championship game against Youngstown State, I believe. Like yep. they've used them and had some success. And they do have some guys who like are good blockers, but I would it'd be interesting if they can get involved. I think this year with Santeo's legs, I feel like play action could be even more dynamic than it was with Cole Johnson. So yeah. get the tight ends involved in some bootlegs or something. Or just scenes. I mean, we saw it with Clayton mm-hmm. Chief his freshman year. He used to do a play action, have the tight end fake a block and then just leak into the seam. It's deadly. And with Cheatham, it seemed to work almost every single time. I'd love to see that brought back into the playbook. And, and that might just be sitting in um sitting in Kirkpatrick's play yeah. playbook that we never really got to see. <laughs> but if Johnny Kirkpatrick ever reveals that secret playbook at ECU, they they could run the table in the American. I, I wouldn't put it past him. I would not put it past him. Um, do you have any other breakout players you want to watch? No, I don't know. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing some more camp storylines that'll hopefully give us some clarity on the two D. I just want to see the roster, but we're we're close to doing that. So moving from what we just talked about, five seconds breakout now, breakout breakout boys. players. It's not like we had to stop a Zoom and restart it because we don't pay for our Zooms and we're stopped at forty minutes. So next, moving on with this breakdown of the season. I think was it last podcast we did? Was it um, a week by week breakdown of the schedule? Yes. So now I think we were very realistic in that, right? Like, I uh-huh. think, let's do a little bold stuff. Like, what what do you think is like a, a I mean, it, I don't want to say insane, a bold thing that will happen this season. Okay, here's what I'll say. This is this isn't maybe as spicy as I might need to make it spicier. But I'll say that JMU will win at least one of the Appalachian State Marshall Louisville games. Okay, which one do you think it is? If one of those. Well, at least one of those Louisville. three. At least one of those three. I don't think. I think. I think they will hold a second half lead against either Appalachian State or Louisville. Not Marshall. Well, I was trying to get spicier. That one's not as spicy. It's home on homecoming. <laughs> but I think they'll hold a second half. Tell you what. They're going to beat Appalachian State. I changed my prediction. They're going to win at Appalachian That's State. not happening. Yes, it is. Chase Price isn't good. He's a good guy, I'm sure. He's no Todd Santeo. <sighs> okay. I don't agree with that, but that's what these bold season predictions are for. That'll right? be my bold prediction. We'll see if I stand by it. Okay, I have two bold season predictions. Okay. And it's an or. That doesn't make sense. So... I think either Todd Santeo will win Sunbelt Player of the Year. <laughs> That's spicy. Or um, or Percy. Really? You think they're going to go five and six with the Sunbelt nope. Player? I think I think with under this bold season prediction, I think they go like okay, four. like I think they pick up a few wins. Like okay, I think the cornerbacks do their job. They'll get whatever this is, but like I think. I, I initially thought, I think Senteo might win the Sunbelt Player of the Year because of what I was just saying about him in the breakout performance set mm-hmm. segment, where I think it's possible that he just storms onto the scene. But then I was like, this is JMU. They don't pass it that much. He's not going to have the stats to back up being Sunbelt Player of the Year. So I was like, well, maybe Percy will get enough carries and run through some defenses really well. And we have a really good run-blocking offensive line, assuming everyone progresses the way we're assuming. Um, I think, I think we'll have an offensive player of the year candidate. I think, I think there's a good chance a JMU Duke wins offensive player of the year. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty darn cool. <laughs> I, I want to lean Todd though, but I just don't think he'll get enough pass attempts, pass attempt app per game. To, it could uh, be efficient enough that he's in the mix. Depending yeah, like on touchdown totals. A few years ago. Yeah. Depending on touchdown totals. Hopefully they can score in the red zone. Although I was crunching some numbers. I remember like the, what, how we were like, JMU just doesn't score in the red zone. They don't score touchdowns. They had a yeah. red zone touchdown efficiency rate of 52.4% by the end of the season. Of touchdowns? Yeah, they scored a touchdown. That's not that good. That's pretty, pretty crappy. But I just thought I was shocked it was over 50%. Like I thought they yeah. were a lot worse. I know that a league average, or I guess nation average, I think was like in the sixties. So they were well below nation average, but I thought it was a lot worse than that. 
I think it felt worse because they were like an elite FCS team playing people they were better than. So it was like, you know, they should be, you would think they'd be getting like almost like 70% of red zone possessions or resulting, yeah. which is obviously high, but um, um, higher expectations than 50. Also, do you want to hear something insane? Yes. I crunched the numbers. I was listening to a couple podcasts uh, previewing the Sun Belt and reading different things, previewing the Sun Belt and the and expectations for each team. And a lot of people were saying that JMU had over 50% of returning production. They get 51%. And I crunched the numbers. In total? Yeah, in what? total. But Offensively? No, just total offense and defense, total production returning. Huh. I crunched the numbers and I found it to be 43% of total production returns and only <laughs> and 42% of offensive productions returning. Well, they lose Cole Johnson and Antoine Wells, yeah. which was a lot. Yeah. And then defensively, they lost Demonte Tucker Dorsey, Wesley McCormick, which is a lot. Mike Green. Mike Green. Yeah. Like, I don't yeah, know. What, that's interesting. I don't and know. Like, even happened. just like Racky. <laughs> I didn't even I didn't even do special teams. Yeah, like, he was like a gazillion points. I guess if he was, if you're only doing offense defense, but yeah. So in, in case you guys were curious, um, I don't know where the national people were getting their numbers. I did all mm-hmm. my calculations by hand, so it could very well be wrong. But at the same time, like it just didn't make sense to me that we were returning over fifty percent of our production from. I wonder if it's some of them. Some do like weighted stuff. I don't know exactly how some of the calculations are done, but. Sure. What I'll say is that Jamie is probably winning the Sun Belt. Um, any other bold predictions other than Jamie winning the Sun Belt? No bold predictions. I do think they have a chance to be better than people think. If they get that week one win, look the F out. Against Middle Tennessee, where they're favored by a touchdown and a half? That I think that could – that is not like a make or break game because, like, it doesn't really matter what happens. But that's one that, like, they can get, and I know people, oh, momentum doesn't exist. If they get that one. Momentum doesn't exist. They're going to roll through Norfolk State, and then you get a bye week. That's a great start. You're in position to have a really good year. If they lose to Middle Tennessee, it's going to be a – it could probably be a struggle. I think that game is going to tell us a lot about the team. That's a a really good point. Okay, that takeaway I agree with. But you're like, if they win, watch out for an undefeated season. If they win, I think the college football playoff committee is – you know, pulling some strings, see if they can make them eligible. And if they lose, I think the CA is coming, coming, calling, see if they can get them back in the league. So it's a big game. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah, uh, preseason awards. Preseason awards. What do we want to do? We got to go MVP, of course. MVP. Offensive player of the year. Offensive player of the year. Defensive player of the year. Uh huh. And coach of the year. <laughs> coach of the year. <laughs> Head coach of the year. Kurt Signetti. <laughs> Oh, we should play oh, newcomer of the I guess we got to do newcomer of the year. Remember when yeah, we we'll uh, remember when we pegged Joel Mensa as the preseason MVP according to Jamie Sports News? We say he's gonna win like conference player <laughs> of the year, and they used him one time to like guard an inbounds because he was tall. That was one of the dumbest things we've ever said. <laughs> uh, it was we only oh man. Well, also, when are they releasing that non-conference schedule? What are we doing here, boys? <laughs> Men's basketball, get on it. Women's basketball, get on it. I want to see these schedules. I'm bored. Although there is this actual sporting event tomorrow, so you can just announce it whenever. It doesn't matter anymore. There's an actual we made event. it back, baby. And there's also literally football coming up in two weeks. Yeah, football's going to be fun. All right. MVP, who do you got? <sighs> MVP. <laughs> can I do the, uh, the Danny Rocco thing where he gives himself the game ball and be like, Kurt Signetti is the MVP. <laughs> Um, Santeo is like a kind of a, a lame. I'm going to say Isaac Ugu. I think Ugu is going to be a leader on the defense. I think he's going to produce a really high level in the defensive line and like put himself in NFL draft conversation. So I think Ugu is going to like step into the Mike Green role, although he'll probably play more on the edge. But I mean, like in terms of leadership, like on the a defensive Rondo. line, and, like a Rondo. yeah, kind of more, maybe a little more Rondo Carter. I like that. Thank you. I'm going to go Percy. I like Percy. I think the way Kurt Signetti is going to call a football game this season, I think he believes that they are capable of winning each game, but I think he also isn't dumb enough where he thinks they out-talent these teams. So I think he's going to do a lot of run heavy. He's going to try and control the clock. He's going to do time of possession. 
I think he's going to make a lot of JMU fans mad because I think we're going to be in a lot of games we shouldn't be in and we should, we're going to be in a lot of games that we sh shouldn't be in, but for the opposite reason. Um, for that reason, I'm going to go Percy because I think he's going to average like 15 to 20 carries a game. And apparently yeah. he looks at, at reports coming out of camp or that he's in the best shape of his life. He's an incredible physical condition. If he's healthy. Yeah, that's a big thing. I think year. last year, Percy would have, you had a bold prediction last year where Percy was going to like break Run for like 2000 yards. Yeah. And I think he was on pace too, if he had played a full season or he would come of like 200 yards short or something where like, your prediction wasn't far off. It's just that he missed half of the year. It was, it was pretty wrong. Well, but it was if, wrong if, because he missed half of the year. I'm saying, like, if we're if we're averaging stuff out, right? And I don't I, remember what his stats were. I got to look that up. I'm going to check maybe, his stats. Because Palmer ended up getting close to 1,000 yards, and it didn't feel like he actually had that. So it's I'm always Palmer thrown was, off. Palmer also averaged, like, four yards per carry last year, but it felt like he was averaging two yards per carry. Yes. They got a lot of guys in the backfield. A lot of guys. A lot of guys. What? Percy, Luttrell, Solomon. Kalon Black's like one of their best. Percy okay. averaged 3.4 yards per carry. So he wasn't, he Never wasn't mind. Really pushing it. I was wrong. <laughs> but uh, hey. My apologies. If he got a whole lot of carries, he could have. He needed like 700 carries. But if he had gotten those 600 carries, he could have he could have pushed it. That'll be my answer, though. That's still my answer. That might have actually, I can't remember if that, that might have been the COVID year when I predicted that. Yeah, that was back to back. When he averaged like five yards a carry and a hundred yards a game, but he only played in seven games. I don't remember. Maybe it was last year. That would have made I sense if I predicted two thousand yards the COVID year. It's like shortened season. Anyway, Percy's a good pick for MVP. I'm going with Ukwu, offensive player of the year. Are you just saying that that's no, I'm gonna Percy. go Chris Thornton. I want to go a little different. I'm gonna go Chris Thornton. Smart. I think smart. I think and it's not that I don't. I mean, I was just singing the praises of Todd Santeo. I think Todd Santeo will be great. And I mean, you have to look at the quarterback for getting the wide receiver the ball. But at the end of the day, I think Chris Thornton is going to fill the role of wide receiver one. I think they're going to do a lot of fun plays to get him the ball in space. He's so dangerous. Last year, he would take a four-yard slant, 92 yards to the house, and he was just electric. Um, I think as the wide receiver one, as the first option time and time again this season, I think he's going to rack up a lot of yards. I think it'll be kind of hard to deny him offensive player of the year honors when he'll probably account for 60% of all air yards. I'll go with Centeo, change it up a little bit. So we have a third name in there. He's a, he's a dog. I think he has that dog in him, Jack. He's him, I would say. And uh, I'm looking forward to watching this kid play. I actually think he's going to be very, very good and like on par with the performances of Ben DiNucci and Cole Johnson. I think he's got a chance to be really yeah, because he was playing. Remember, a lot of people forget this. He played at Colorado State, and their head coach was Steve Adazio. And people Steve people Adazio, you might as well have a golden retriever be your head coach. You'd get better better stuff than what you're getting from Adazio. So uh, I think with Signetti, Sanceri, they got Shanahan, the offensive coordinator. That's a good group of coaches. And I think a, a good coaching is going to do him some solid. So I think he'll play really well. I like that he can use his legs. It's just, I don't know, every, I feel like every quarterback they've had in this system, they've found a way to reduce turnovers um, without getting rid of the ability to make game-changing plays. So maybe at some point that changes, but I believe in Centeo this year. All right. Who's your defensive player of the year? I won't say Uku, so I, so I don't repeat. Mm, you know what? Give me Sam Kidd. I think Sam Kidd's really? going to make it. Make, I think he's going to be a leader. I think he's going to make a big time impact. And I also think he's going to be a stud on special teams. So I'll say he's a, a defensive MVP, not necessarily the best athlete out there, but he <laughs> coaches son type mentality. No, he is, he's a really good player. And I think he is somebody who has elite athleticism and is a really good tackler. And I think he's somebody maybe with some of those young linebackers, can you move Sam kid at safety into the box a little bit more and have, you know, someone else playing safety or whatever that moves over to corner for a bit. I don't know, but I think you could play him in the box where he's almost like a hybrid linebacker and he can make a lot of plays. So I'm excited to see how they could use him um, in a variety of ways. Cause he's someone I think could be really beneficial on special teams and defensively. Okay. I dig that. Um, I dig it. I dig it. I dig it. 
so I'm going between two people and I, I really don't know which. I'm going between Q. But I think I'm going to go Jalen Green. That's a bold one. I like that. I know. I, I, I talked highly of Abby. Um, I think he'll have a really good season. And I think him, Ukwu, I think the defensive player of the year is going to be someone on this offensive line. This is ooh, very wrong. That would be, that would be bold. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. They, they, they play line. him two ways. <laughs> um, Jalen Green played in 14 games in 2019. He got injured in the fall of 2020. Um, missed the 2021 COVID season due to that injury in the fall. And then coming into 2021 in the fall, man, that COVID year was weird. He played in 13 games last year. He had 14 tackles, two and a half TFLs, two sacks, forced fumble, pass breakup, and a quarterback hurry. Um, there was a lot of hype around him coming in. Yeah. He was supposed to fill that role right away that Rondell left and, and all this, I think having kind of a defensive line by committee will kind of help Jalen Green this season. And so I think, I think Jalen Green might be able to put up some gaudy numbers this year. I like that. I'm going to throw out the name Jamari Edwards as well. The Marshall transfer, right. I think, has a chance to be huge. The reason we do this is if you throw enough names out there, we'll come back and look at this at the end of the season. We're like, oh, we didn't pick them, but we did mention them. Yeah, exactly. As always. I mean, that, that's how you do. That's how you do it. Newcomer of the year. Newcomer of the year is a good question. I'm actually, why don't I take Edwards for newcomer of the year? I think he's going to be a beast on the defensive line at 6'3, 281. You could maybe move him around a little bit, right? He's got enough size where if you stick him more toward the middle of the line, he's not going to get eaten up, but he's played, he was spent five seasons at Marshall. So this guy is no stranger to the FBS. He's ready to go. I've been told by some people that the FBS it's a, it's a tougher weekly grind week in and week out. Um, I think he's gonna be able to handle that. He's he's been through it, and like you mentioned, where they have so many guys in the defensive line, they can sub in and out. When you have someone like him who's yeah. gonna be fresh most of the time that he's on the field, I think that'll make him a pretty dangerous weapon out there. I like that pick. Um, I'm gonna go with the very obvious answer. Okay, Thompson Teo. Ah, uh, it's a bold pick. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> You were wondering why. Why didn't you pick a Todd for the Offensive Player of the Year or MVP or something like that? Because I was so holding, him. I was holding him in my back pocket to do Newcomer of the Year. Um, I mean, the most visible position, the position that holds the ball on quite literally every single offensive play. Uh, my man's is going to be the Newcomer of the Year and potentially. Best, sorry. Best name. name. Todd Santeo? Oh, no, best, best name. Seth Nautila. No, it's, it's Tate Beaver. <laughs> I, I hope Tate. I want Tate Beaver to start a linebacker, just so that Tate Beaver is the starting linebacker. I'm trying to see other other names real quick on a quick. Uh, He's up there. I mean, it's hard to beat Tate Beaver. Caden Schickel, shout out Caden Schickel, a uh, redshirt freshman long snapper for the team from Massaponics, um, Massaponics in Fredericksburg, Virginia. That is my alma mater. So shout out to uh, Caden Schickel. Uh, really well, that's huge keeping the ponics name going with uh, an elite long snapper coming into town yeah it's it's good to have some uh some long snapper snappers from your hometown in there and now we have to go to the best part of every episode unless you have anything else you want to add no the questions questions twitter questions that's the best part yeah, Twitter we got questions. we got some we had some weird questions. I was a little confused <laughs> by these. Would Coach be cool letting Eric Cooster sing the national anthem on September third? I've heard it's a lifelong dream of his. Cooster, I, Custer, who knows? I don't know who that guy is, and it seems to be an inside <laughs> joke. As at JMU Dukes for Life responded to that with saying, "Now that's something I'd like to witness." And then it appears Eric J <laughs> at Jenkins Circle. Uh, responded with laughing emojis. Not sure who Eric is. Eric, if you want to be a, a, a guest on the podcast, I'd love to get to the bottom of this inside joke. I, uh, I love inside jokes. I'd love to be a part of one one day. Yeah, exactly. Um, next up, who should be the ceremonial coin <laughs> person on September 3rd? Do we go football program legend with uh, Mickey Matthews, D. Lloyd, <laughs> Charles Haley, not we're not getting Charles. Charles Haley will never come back to Harrisonburg, Virginia. 
or do we go the donor route and it's a plecker or go out of the box and have someone like C King do it. Peeps need to know. Thank you at C I N O G Z. Um, if you're asking us who the coin flip person should be, it's us. Yeah. I was going to say humbly, <laughs> you know, I, we come to you humbly. <laughs> but us. I also don't know. Like, if they're going for some, I, I think if you go with a program legend, you might want to go like badly or like someone more modern that helped them get to this stage. Like badly was instrumental in getting them to the FBS level. So was Brian Shore. I would ben say Gucci even. You go, you go to like P lot and you do a breathalyzer test. And you take the druggest person, <laughs> and the druggest person gets to do the coin toss. <laughs> I don't think that either. No, I don't know. I don't even. I'm. <laughs> I don't care. Um, at Bob, it, it would be kind of cool if they did have like a, a person of interest for the FBS game doing the coin toss, but uh, I, I don't. Know. Yeah. Um. At bottom underscore nine best tailgate games. Cornhole. This person, Bill Pap, thinks <laughs> cornhole is way overrated. Um. He'll vote for giant Jenga. I don't mean to be rude when I say this. Giant <laughs> Jenga is the absolute worst tailgate game that I've ever heard someone vote for. It's cornhole, <laughs> it's beer pong, it's anything but giant Jenga. <laughs> giant Jenga is cumbersome, it's loud, it's not fun to play. You got you have a beer in one hand and you're already drunk and tick. But giant Jenga is just absolutely abysmal. And the fact that you're going to call cornhole overrated and then vote for giant Jenga is just unacceptable, Bill Pap. Yeah, it should, is it alarming at all that my only thoughts were drinking games? I was like, who is playing? <laughs> People play tailgate games. I was like, yeah, it was like cornhole or or beer pong or like, I don't think anyone's playing flip cup really at a tailgate. So it's- Beard it, eye or- like stack cut like i'm playing, yeah i'm playing pre-game games at a tailgate i'm typically just trying to put as much alcohol and food in my body as possible as my is the game that i prefer yeah and it corn and people are either really good or really bad bill pap you're playing with the wrong people because i play with a plenty of mediocre <laughs> cornhole players <laughs> we always have a great time <laughs> Um, Bill Pat also sound. asked, yeah, go what's ahead. the Mount Rushmore for football? Oh, man. We did a Mount Rushmore for JMU athletes in general, but I think football, we're going to get a lot of hate for this every single time we do one, but, like, I feel like Bad Lee's got to be up there. <laughs> you put that anytime anything comes <laughs> up. You're, like, greatest quarterbacks of our, of our lifetime. I don't know, Bad. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> let's put like chalice mcmillan is that his name oh the, yeah chalice uh, gets up there charles haley gets up there gary yeah. probably gets up there you might have to put in our boy mickey matthews Dude. and then you got to consider everett withers for what he did bring in the juice bringing the juice back to the program with the uniforms well if you're and, gonna consider uh, everett withers you got to consider mike houston lock the damn gates mike houston's speeches only his speeches. And Chalice McMillan, Carl really Haley, moments, Mike Houston speeches. Moments in our JMU history that deserve the Mount Rushmore. Not like okay. anything. Like moments. Mike Houston speeches get up there. Okay, Mike Houston speeches is a good little twist. I got to say the badly, like what he ran for 250 through for 250 against SMU, like yeah. video game stuff. that We should have won that game by like 30. Well, the um, won it by three though, because... That was a that was a withers year and tackling was was optional. <laughs> then they they cut in they, they cut into the locker room for that video. The defensive coaches are just yelling, being like, "Be the captain of your soul in the the captain of your ship." And it's like, "Have you done anything tackling wise this week in practice? Is there anything schematically you could tell them? <laughs> Follow your your north star." <laughs> what if? Here's another one from that same season. The Elon shutout with the same defense. <laughs> That's a good one. Any other moments? I forgot they shut somebody out that year. Yeah. 
It's hard. It's that's the most. It's not the fact that that defense was abysmal. It's that they shut out Elon for a game. That was UVA had some like that last year, folks. They had like two shutouts, and they think they averaged like at least thirty points allowed per game, probably more. They're giving up sixty in every other game. So there, maybe there's some in the water in that Shenandoah Valley. Uh, any other great moments? Well, the national championships up there. The win at Fargo. It's up there. I guess. Those are those are probably the ones. That, oh, the the Racky walk off against Weber State. Yeah, it's a there's a yeah. that's a tough one to narrow down that list. Here's here's one last question before we get up on out of here. Which felt better, the win in Fargo or the national championship? The win in Fargo. I think the win in Fargo. Yeah, you were there for that, right? No, Matt went. We only had one for that one, so I was. Uh, oh. Yeah, he had been covering them a little more due to our class schedules, and you can't have the guy showing up to Monday practices grinding and then be like, I want to go to North Dakota. I was like, you got it, man. Live it up. You're a nice person. That was nice of you. It was. A lot of people are saying that. And it would be nice to get some sort of reward back, though, which would be like a coin toss at the opener. (laughs) We could also – I feel like we could rig that. How? We could have him win the toss somehow. Tails and, like – you blindfold the ref and I flip it or something. And, you know. I take him down. <laughs> I punch him down. <laughs> Jump the ref as you're going tossing it. <laughs> All right. Anything you want to add for this episode? No, we'll have a preview at some point here soon, huh? Yeah, I get both of our pools. We were trying to do like that mega preview, and I think we'll still like do a preview that's kind of mega. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But I think the fact that I've been in Iowa for two weeks and you're going to the beach. Go to the beach, I'm really through a wrench in everything. But uh, if you're at the Iowa State Fair, come check us out. Come come check us out. Like we have a booth. At, come check out DRF Sportsbook at the, uh, the Iowa State. Yeah, I do. I do like that. Uh, that casual drop. If you're at the Iowa State <laughs> Fair, you know what I <laughs> ate at the Iowa State Fair a few days ago. That was very interesting. Yeah, hit us rattlesnake and alligator corn dogs corn dogs i've had gator before i had rattlesnake tastes like um it wasn't great it was also like me it wasn't like they 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 rounded into like a sausage so it was more like okay that makes a little uh, sense a hot dog so it fit the corn dog mold better i would never order it again you're probably not gonna have too many opportunities (laughs) (laughs) no that's very valid uh, I also had a hot beef Sunday yesterday, which was mashed. Oh, potatoes. What? <laughs> it was you hear this you hear this mashed potatoes like slow cooked beef with gravy, and then they top it with cheese as the sprinkles and a cherry tomato as the cherry on top. It actually doesn't sound horrible. It was actually quite delicious, and I also had a blue cheese bacon burger, maybe oh, the yeah. best burger I've ever had in my life. So the food there does sound like it would be enjoyable, although my stomach would be going through it. Yeah, I had a salad the other night. I like how this podcast is now veered into state fair food. I had a salad the other night. I had never craved a salad as much as I had craved that salad. That's a good That's a good thing to have. Was it good? It was all right. Yeah. It was a Walmart like pre-made salad. Oh, okay. Everything closes in Iowa at 8 p.m. I, I do want to put it out there that if this Eric person wants to sing the national anthem to open one of our podcasts, the offer stands. <laughs> I am right. For Bennett Conlon, my name is Jack Fitzpatrick. Have a wonderful rest of your day. See ya. listening to believe you can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform check us out at believe.com and search for b-l-e-a-v on youtube